Hi, this is Stephen Mead, lifelong entrepreneur, business owner, and global speaker. Over the years, I've read hundreds of books and spent thousands of hours developing what I call the bullseye belief system. And I've used that system to develop my own companies, as well as help others learn to be specific, targeted, and focused to get exactly what they want in life. Again, I'm Stephen Mead, and this is the Bullseye Guy Podcast. Stephen Mead again, back with another Bullseye Guy podcast, returning from Davos, Munich, uh, a lot of fun places. But speaking of fun places, one of the, the things I'm fortunate to have been able to do through the last couple of years is the Monaco Grand Prix, the Monaco Formula One. And with me today is Nicholas Frankel, who is the prepare, 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 proponent Proprietor. Proprietor. Proprietor of my yacht group. We're going to move forward to that, but before we do, I'm going to introduce Nicholas. He's got a fascinating, amazing background. And before we talk about how he ends up with Prince Albert and Eric Schmidt of Google and these amazing people around the world on super yachts, which sounds like a, a fun job. I know it's a lot of work. I've seen him work hard for that. I want Nicholas to introduce himself. He's got a fascinating background from everything with what he's done with his life, but also the sports side. So Nicholas Frankel, give us a little introduction. Goodness, that's a, it's already a huge introduction. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having me. It's very nice of you to make the time, and it's lovely to be here in downtown, uh, very hot and sunny Los Angeles, uh, Oscar week. Yeah. Um, so I don't know where to start. I mean, I guess um, my, my background, thanks to my father uh, and my mother, was very much related to um, and evolved around motor racing in Formula One. Uh, and so I think I went to my first Grand Prix with my twin sister Annabelle when we were aged something around eight weeks old. Uh, and of course, back then it was pretty noisy. So I'm amazing. It's amazing that my hearing is still as good <laughs> as it is. Uh, and um, so we spent a lot of time in our in our youth uh, around motor racing. And that was back in the days with, um, you know, uh, late racing legends like Mario Andretti and Emerson Fittipaldi and James Hunt and Nicky Lauda. Uh, and uh, so that's, you know, uh, how I got into uh, racing and sports and knowing about things like the Monaco Grand Prix. Uh, and so that was the, sort of the, the early stages. Yeah, and I've, I've been fortunate to meet your dad and, and Annabelle. They're great. But that was the Formula One side. Yeah. What I find interesting is you grew up in? In London. In London. But you were in the Olympics in an interesting sport that I wouldn't think of. It's for not, Lennon. so not let's talk first, about that. It's yeah. not the first thing that comes to mind. I remember the <laughs> the uh, the Daily Mail newspaper and the Evening Standard uh, newspaper in, in London, uh, in England, and uh, they ran a story saying uh, these bobsledders are training for the Olympics in Wandsworth Park, which was the equivalent, uh, which is just in by the Thames uh, River, uh, which is the equivalent of sort of saying uh, you know these athletes are training uh, on Santa Monica Boulevard. Or on you know on ocean right. for the for the Winter Olympics for the Winter Olympics yeah and um, which is what we were doing and uh, so you know we didn't have any bobsled tracks in England <laughs> of course uh, and even more uh, peculiarly I was actually training and representing very proudly the first Hungarian bobsled team because my father uh, is Hungarian he escaped in 1956 during the Russian Revolution went to the UK. And of course, he was involved in motorsports, and I was getting into motorsports and testing cars and racing cars, and and a lot of his friends had been killed uh, in in Formula One in in, in the previous you know, decades, and so he thought, you know, well, uh, maybe there's something else that you could do because you probably won't be world champion because uh, you're good, but you're not that good, <laughs> and um, so is there anything else that you could do? And I was watching the Olympics in 1992, which was from France in Albertville, La Plame. And the and my father was commentating on the bobsled because it was like Formula One, and he he's been commentating on Formula One for fifty years, uh, and um, so at the time we realised that Austria were the Olympic champions, and but there were also these amazing countries like you know, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago and the Virgin Islands and uh, Puerto Rico, very small nations in Caribbean countries yeah. and South Pacific, you know, and. No, uh, no, no snow around them either. And Austria, being the Olympic champion, of course, was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, Hungary didn't have a team at all and had never re been represented uh, in the Winter Olympics in bobsledding. So we thought this was a great opportunity uh, and a source of great pride for our nation uh, to to start a team. Now, of course, 
we had absolutely no concept or understanding of the sport at all. Uh, and as the, the, the gentleman from CBS television, um, Harry Smith, I think his name was, he used to be on CBS. He was a, yeah, eagle uh, shaking his head, yeah. so I guess he remembers. <laughs> Harry Smith, I think it was. Uh, and a very learned TV uh, guy. And I don't know if he did the Today Show or something like that. And he said to me, um, so Nicholas, basically, when you started this, you didn't know the difference between a bobsled and a barbecue. <laughs> and I said, that is exactly right, because I had never seen one. And the first time I <laughs> ever saw a bobsled was actually the first time I ever got really in a bobsled, which was in uh, Eagles uh, in Innsbruck in Austria, where they have a bobsled school wow. and a bobsled track. They had had the Olympics there back in the 60s. I think it was 68, but I might be wrong. And um, the uh, so I went there. And, and the, the, beauty thing, the beautiful thing about bobsledding is it's not like racing a car or, 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 or running or, or, or cycling or anything like that. When you get it wrong in bobsledding, you crash. And when you crash in a bobsled, it's unbelievably unpleasant. I mean, it's really like having a car crash. Uh, and But not a car crash that it doesn't finish anytime soon because yeah. you're doing 65, 70, 75 miles an hour. If you want you to stick your hand out the window when you're doing 75 miles an hour, you get an idea as to how fast you're going. Um, and then you, 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 know, you focus that down onto a little two-man bobsled on hard ice, very yeah. hard, very wet, very cold ice. Uh, and um, when you go upside down on a bobsled, you're, you're going fast and you're on an ice track. So you don't stop. You just keep going all the way down. And the bobsled rotates and rolls around and you get shaken around like in a, being in, wow. a, in a washing machine. And um, anything that touches the ice at that point, which is mostly your body or your crash helmet, um, is, is going to get burnt. So you burn through your helmet. You burn through your skin. You end up with having you know, to go and have you know, skin grafts and things. for the bob, you know, The bobsledders have a lot of those in their shoulders. So it's pretty unpleasant. So... It's incredibly thrilling and exciting on one side. Hmm. So the upside is incredibly thrilling. The downside is incredibly painful. Uh, and so if you do crash, and when you start, you of course, you make mistakes. Um, and you, But if you start crashing a lot, two, three, four, five times, um, you, you're going to end up in hospital pretty quickly. Uh, and I mean, I did. And, um, and then also, you won't get anyone to come in the back of the bobsled with you because they'll be so terrified. <laughs> um, they'll, or, or they'll be in hospital as well. You just run out of brakemen. Um, so it's a fairly steep learning curve, but I was, I at least understood the physics part of it and how the pressure system works because you, you're, you're driving a very heavy object down, a, down this ice track and you have this enormous pressure building as you go around the corners. So it's all about steering huh. and controlling the pressure of the bobsled. And that's what allows, allows you to go down uh, smoothly, at least in practice, uh, uh, you know, smoothly. So... I didn't crash very much. The first few weeks of bobsledding actually didn't crash at all, so that got me excited. And then I went to a very famous track in uh, um, uh, Italy called Cortina Don Pezzo, which is where uh, they have uh, had the Olympics before, and they're going to have the Olympics again. They just won the Olympics back. They shot the James Bond movies there. It's very, very cool. And, um, and then uh, went back to Austria in uh, February and crashed and went straight to hospital. Wow. So I woke up in Innsbruck in a hospital and looked at this nurse and I thought, I, I actually did think I died and got to heaven because she was so beautiful. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, and that was, so that was the kind of, you know, that moment where, you know, you end up having a brain scan and are you okay? And I had concussion and stuff and, and I was fine. And I said, okay, we've got to get back on the horse, so to speak, and keep doing it. Wow. So first race was January uh, <coughs> 93 and we went zero to the Olympics in one year as a purely amateur, purely amateur team. And what was your big takeaway from the Olympics? If you were to pick one or two things, what sort of stuck with you? Um, the opening ceremony is very special. Okay. I mean, the Lillehammer Olympics in 1994 was an exceptional Olympics. It was the last small family Olympics. Um, you know, this was a, a village of 16,000 people, which then suddenly had the Olympics party come to town. Um, and which is hundreds of thousands of people. So it was really, if you speak to anyone like Peekaboo Pika Street or any of these uh, old Olympic athletes um, who competed in multiple games, and they'll all tell you that they, they look very fondly upon uh, Lillehammer. Um, and I would say that, I mean, suddenly being an athlete, I was young, I was 21 years old, and being an athlete and walking into the opening ceremony is, is, is just really an awesome yeah. feeling. I mean, it's extraordinary. And you think to yourself, my goodness, you know, how did I get here? Um, and also waking up every morning and having breakfast in the Olympic Village in the dining room, uh, which is obviously, it's a huge cafeteria, but everyone's there. I mean, all the athletes are there. So you're rubbing shoulders. At the time, it was Torval and Dean, who were the British ice skating duo, and Tara Lipinski. Yeah, wow. You know, uh, and of course, you had Tonya Harding and all those. Uh, so 
they were all there. And Herman Meyer, I think, was a skier at the time. Uh, so there was some really, you know, obviously at the, for, for their time, uh, uh, th th those were the athletes. Tommy Moe, I think, was Olympic champion for the United States for downhill skiing at that, that year. Um, so th that was a takeaway. I think the other thing was that everyone assumes that Olympics – is um, the best of the best, and and of course it is. But it's run by each federation, so each each sport brings their best athletes uh, to to the Olympic Games. But the Olympic Games is not just about the gold, the silver, and the bronze. The Olympic Games is about, as as they have advertised quite correctly, celebrating humanity, um, celebrating amateurs, uh, you know, doing good to the world. The Olympic competitors from many many countries are not going to win any medals. But they are representing their nation proudly, and they are heroes in their countries, especially the smaller countries. And so, and you know, you never say you're an ex-Olympian. You know, you <laughs> you are an Olympic athlete. There are no ex-Olympic athletes, and there is an amazing body now called the World Olympians Association, which is the alumni body of approximately seventy thousand athletes around the world. Uh, we now wear pins with O L Y, which stands for Olympic athlete. Uh, we have that on the end of our names. And um, it's a, it's really a, um, I wouldn't call it a, a heavy burden, but I would call it a, a, a pride that you carry with you. Uh, and when you meet people, and most people I deal with on a daily basis or have known you for many years do not know that I have been in the Olympics because I don't really talk about it that much. And mm -hmm. if they don't know, they just don't know. Um, obviously, there is a community of bobsledders and we all know each other. And there's a community of athletes who I who have become great friends. And the friendships that you make from sport are really great friends. And that is that that's the same for myself or anyone who competes. You know, you're when you've gone through that type of emotion and struggle uh, and failure and triumph and live that with a community of people, your own team and other teammates. Um, you will. You're never going to forget those those guys. Yeah, uh, it's a very it's a very real thing. And how did you transition then from that to the stuff you were doing with BAFTA, which sort of led you into the the Maya group of what you have now? When I came to LA, I had a beverage company actually, uh, which was a lot of fun. I've always been an entrepreneur. I had met a team of uh, energy drink executives in Australia at the Melbourne Grand Prix in 1996. Uh, and I had started working in Asia with an energy drink called Hype Energy, which is still on sale today. The executive team then left, and we set up our own beverage company called Fuse Plus, uh, which consequently we raised money in London. We started selling in the UK, and, I, and then we started selling in the US, and I did a bunch of distribution deals with Trader Joe's and 7-Eleven, all these guys. Yeah. And uh, so we sold the company back in around 2002, and then I was asked to join or to set up a sports marketing agency here, uh, which I did for a UK company. And I ran around talking to all the great brands of America, uh, and, which was enormous fun. And all the, you know, at the time, I remember sitting in the offices of Kodak in Atlanta with a gentleman who was running their Olympics program. And I, so I'd, I'd met him before and I said, oh, I'm doing a new thing now. And we were developing a software algorithm for sponsorship. Uh, to allow sponsors to to have a much more efficient way to communicate. And um, he said, Nicholas, you know, we're the fourth most, rec fourth most recognized brand in the world. You know, we don't need anyone. That was Kodak. Kodak. <laughs> Where are they today? Um, so, uh, you know, he said, you know, do you know how much film we sold at the Sydney Olympics? You know, um, you know, uh, so he was very proud of himself. But, um, but long story, I then moved into sponsorship marketing. I'd always been in Formula One, of course, with – with my Bobstead team, I had my own sponsors as well because yeah. it was privately funded. And so in the US, I had become a member of the British Academy of Film and Television here in, in Los Angeles. And I started working for them to try and raise funding. They are a 501c3 corporation. And we raised, uh, we took them from approximately $50,000 to a few million dollars in revenue in a relatively short period of time, transformed the academy, uh, transformed their, their giving uh, and their 501c3 programs which are actually right down here in, in uh, downtown LA, the Helen Keller Park projects uh, to helping gangs, uh, actually uh, gangs' children hang out together. The Cribs and the Bloods kids could play in the same park. You know, previously <coughs> wow. couldn't, couldn't do it. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a great, that was a, a great initiative. And um, in, in addition to that, with the brands that I was working with, I had already started obviously attending the Monaco Grand Prix uh, this is going back 28 years ago, and I could see that there was an opportunity having run the Ferrari sponsorship uh, with a uh, with the royal jeweler called Asprey. So Asprey is the royal jeweler, 
Uh, they make the crowns and the diamonds and all these things for the for the royal family. And they have a boutique, well, more than a boutique, they have a, a store in London on um, Bond Street, and they're a 250-year-old store, uh, a, a family-owned, they were family-owned. And um, I had started a yacht party with the Ferrari team and the, and the Asprey clients back in 97, 98, 99, when Michael Schumacher, who then went on to be seven-time world champion, and Eddie Irvine, was driving for them, and Jean Todd, who is now the president of the FIA, uh, was the head of Ferrari uh, Motorsport. And so I saw that th the whole um, specialness of the Monaco Grand Prix obviously is a super yacht. That's where everybody wants to be. Yeah. And I had the opportunity with my relationships with the principality and my relationships with Formula One and my relationships with brand partners to bring all of those people together and to create something which was unique. And so that's what really started the My Yacht Originally, it was My Yacht Monaco and now My Yacht Group um, 15 years ago. This year will be our 15th year at the Monaco Grand Prix. And and for My Yacht Group, which, again, I've been fortunate to attend some. They're amazing. But how would you, if somebody were to ask you what it is, mm -hmm. how would you describe what it is? Because I want to first hear you say what it is, and then I want us to delve into what it actually is when you're mm. participating. Because until you've been, you don't understand it. But if I said, Nicholas, what is My Yacht Group? What's your answer for that? It's a global high net worth, ultra high net worth, and influencer uh, networking company, uh, which sounds like complete nothing, <laughs> um, but actually is really, really interesting. And in, on my business card, it says connector in chief, because that effectively is what I'm yeah. doing. I connect people, uh, and you know the revenue model is based upon brands, uh, you know, from all sorts of walks of life, all sorts of categories, whether it be blockchain, whether it be automotive. Uh, watches, jewelry, aerospace, or in some cases, actually space, 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 uh, yeah. space, space. Um, and you know the demands of those companies is either to raise funding, uh, to to raise awareness and visibility, uh, to engage with their existing clients in mm -hmm. a in a in a uh, you know cohesive and authentic environment, and of course to meet qualified people who they might be able to do business with. Uh, so uh, I have found that the USP, the, you know, the unique selling proposition of a super yacht at these high profile locations around the world um, is a much more compelling and exciting invitation for the end user, for the people who are being invited than a standard boutique reception yeah. or come to our dealership or come to a nice hotel ballroom or come to this beautiful house. Well, super yachts me. in my experience trump everything. And let's let's talk about that from a business model standpoint because, again, I've, I've fortunately I've been there. You have super, ultra luxury high end brands mm -hmm. coalesced with on the on the 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 yacht. It's a hundred, one hundred and fifteen. There's a, a finite number of people mm -hmm. that are allowed on. And again, I've yeah. I've I've watched you do this. It's I I don't envy you at all because. <laughs> It's an insurance issue. It's not, oh, hey, we'll let more people on. It's no, you no. only have a certain number of people. Yeah. Yeah. And when you have people on the dock at Monaco, it's like the Oscars. Everybody thinks they're somebody. Yes. And you've got guys worth 100, 200, 300 million. A bit. You're like, I'm sorry, you can't come on. But you're curating an environment for the brand mm -hmm. that that's really the, the value proposition. Like being able to attend is fabulous. But for the brands, talk about kind of what you do uniquely because the Monaco one is probably the jewel, but you mm -hmm. also do Concorde de Legans and yeah. Art Basel. There's other yeah. ones around, but how do you really curate for the brands? Because that's the value proposition for, for your business. It depends upon the brand specifically uh, because some brands are, are focused. I mean, for instance, with the space company, this is an extreme uh, sharp end of the needle because if effectively, if you're not a billionaire, you're probably not going to go to space. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least not today, um, with this program because it's a $50 million program um, and it's the world's most expensive experience. So if you're only if you're only dealing with that type of environment, that, that is a very, very narrow uh, um, audience. Uh, most of the brands that we work with are slightly broader so that, a, you know, a, so that an individual who is, let us say, worth uh, you know five million, ten million, twenty-five million, hundred million, whatever, um, is someone who's who's interested in that brand or interested in investing in new tech companies yeah. or biotech companies, um, has a family office. Um, you know, it, it's not all about wealth. I mean, people always say to me, uh, "Well, you know, if you're not rich, you can't come to your event." And I said, "That's absolutely not true." Uh, you know, what is interesting about what we curate there is that it is all about the world's most interesting people. Yeah. It is not about their checkbook being interesting. It's about them being interesting. So we love having 
you know, thought provoking, interesting uh, people who are successful in their fields, whether it be cancer surgeons, whether it be uh, explorers who are going to up the tops of mountains or going down to the depths of the oceans, uh, innovators, uh, you know, scientists, of course, athletes, Olympic yeah. athletes. Uh, you know, some we have, of course, lots of Olympic athletes coming and Olympic champions and others. Um, a, a huge, broad spectrum of people. Celebrities per se, I don't particularly personally find interesting. Uh, at least media celebrities. Um, so I tend not to go after that audience, but it depends how you categorize a celebrity. For me, Buzz Aldrin is a celebrity. Yes. He's an interesting person. Not only do you not go after the celebrities, I know you've left a few of them on the dock who have been rather rather frustrated because their ego was bruised that they couldn't well, get on. And it's I've seen it happen. So These things happen. I don't envy you. Let's, let's talk about a couple programs because the one you have currently is really – Fascinating, and I, I love how you gloss over them because to you, you live it every day. Mm -hmm. You said, oh, space, like this. And there's a space program you're involved with right now. Part of the format is the My Yacht Group are these very highly curated dinners and invitationally around what might be a Monaco Formula One event or what might be a Concorde de la Gans. What's the project that you're working on with the space opportunity because it is unique it is very unique and it's actually it is actually game changing so there is a company out of houston texas uh, which has been founded uh, by uh, you know the most serious and accomplished uh, nasa executives and astronauts uh, called axiom space um, they actually just won uh, a week ago um, a very unique um, i guess it was a prize uh, you could say but they won a competition um, with NASA to be elected to be or selected to be the the sole partner currently to build a commercial space module onto the existing space, space station. station. Yeah. The existing space station, for those who don't know, is currently above our heads, 400 kilometers up, so about 250 miles above our heads. It's been there for 20 years orbiting. Uh, it's normally got about four to six people on board from 15 different countries who own the International Space Station. It cost approximately $100 billion, and the operating budget is approximately $3.5 billion a year. But that station, it will um, retire in the next five, seven years, and there is no replacement planned from a governmental perspective. Yeah. So, so this company has the opportunity now, effectively, to own research development uh, and, uh, and manufacturing in space on their own space station. And, and in addition to that, they have developed a, um, a tourism model um, and there will be uh, an expanded uh, hotel opportunity, if you want to describe it as that, a hotel in space. Um, and currently what we are doing is going around the world communicating to these ultra high net worth individuals that if they, you know, once you've achieved a certain status in your life and a certain degree of success, uh, and you've got a super yacht or two super yachts, and you've got foundations, and you've got charities, and you've there built, are many a, you've built left a hospital. In this world, you can do so. You there have are, to leave the world, right? So <laughs> you know, if, once you've done a lot of those achievements, um, a lot of people have a have a vision <clears throat> to say, okay, well, what does this planet really look like from 400 kilometers up? Yeah, and, and it and it will unquestionably change your life. It will change your world, your perspective of the world. It will change your legacy that you leave behind uh, as a fully private astronaut. Um, in the last 20 years, uh, there was a Russian program uh, which was operating on and off uh, sporadically, which allowed people like Guy Laliberté, who mm -hmm. was the founder Cirque of Cirque du Soleil, Soleil um, who achieved you know, great success. And he's the type of global visionary that you want to be in space and then come back down yeah. and tell everybody about it. And he shot an incredible uh, book, a huge book that he made from all his photographs. And I actually have one of his photographs on my wall in Monaco, wow. um, which he shot from 400 kilometers up of, his, of, of this incredible blue, the blueness of Lake Baikal. Uh, and yeah, I'm proud to have it. And yeah. so you know, if you speak to anyone who's been up there, uh, uh, Charles Simony from Microsoft, who was the founder of Microsoft Word or the creator of Microsoft Word and others in Microsoft Office, he's been twice. <laughs> and in fact, I was talking to um, their chief astronaut, Michael Lopez Alegria, who's a four-time world record holding astronaut, three shuttle commands, one Soyuz command wow. launched from Russia more than 250 days in space and the world record holding American astronaut for the number and the amount of time spent space walking. I 
think approximately 68 hours spacewalking. So he yeah. physically built the International Space Station with his hands. Wow. And I just said to him, we were chatting, uh, you know, incredible, remarkable man. And he was about to be inducted into the into the Hall of Fame in, in Cape Canaveral uh, in May, uh, which we'll be attending. And I was saying to him, oh, yeah, you know, so what was it like up at the space station? And we were talking about the people who'd been up there to meet him. And he, I, and we talked about Charles. He said, oh, yeah, I met Charles. I said, well, where did you meet him? He said, I met him on the space station. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? And I said, well, of course you did. You know, I want to be in the bar when the girl comes up and sees you two next to each other. So how'd you guys meet? In space. Yeah, in space, on the space in station. Space. Yeah. So it's wow. cool stuff. And so that one really has two parts to it that you've talked to me about, which I think are fascinating. One is the opportunity to actually be part of the next generation space station. It's an investment opportunity. They're going to build another station, Correct. privatize, yes. commercialize all sorts of things. And then there's this little, oh, if you've got an extra $50 million and want to spend 10 days in space, yeah. you can buy a ticket. You can buy a ticket. It's 15 weeks training at Houston yeah. and out here in California, their partner is SpaceX, as well as Boeing, they're partnered with mm -hmm. both. Um, SpaceX, as many of you uh, listeners and uh, viewers will know, um, has the, uh, the the Dragon rocket, the Heavy Dragon, and they have the capsule, the Dragon 2 capsule, which is going up. Yeah. Um, and um, it's already uh, been up to the space station, I think, something like 15 or 16 times already. Uh, and they're going to have the crew version of that um, launch, I think, uh, certainly in the next few months with the first NASA astronauts. So okay. they will, for the first time since the space shuttle retired, which I believe was 2011, the U.S. will be launching astronauts back to the International Space Station. In the, the last uh, decade or so, we have only relied on the Russians uh, to do that. So it's good to have your own ability to do that. Yeah. Well, with 50 million, you can buy your ability up, which is amazing. The um, the the Mayak group, I know that the events are around the world. I want to go back to Monaco for a minute because mm -hmm. the Formula One is one of the premier events. So you've got these layers. My, my other podcast actually was on layers at Davos and mm -hmm. these sort of abilities to get in. So you've got Formula One, then you have the super yacht, mm -hmm. then you have the exclusive invitations and the private brands that you've curated mm -hmm. amazingly, but then you've also partnered with the Prince Albert Foundation yes. where it's a busy time of the year. It's yes. a busy weekend. Busy weekend. And he's hanging out for three hours on the yacht talking to people. So what? for a minute, just talk about, uh, uh, Albert's amazing and you've known him. I've met him once through you, but you do tie things into philanthropy and foundation, Absolutely. not just Prince Albert's, the Blue Angels, Absolutely. some other ones. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that side of the Maya group as it ties into philanthropy, mm -hmm. because you have an opportunity that most people don't to really move the needle. Mm. Uh, all of our uh, super yacht events are charity related. Uh, and so our objectives with the charity partners, which include uh, Yacht Aid Global uh, in Florida. So they are a company, a brilliant company, who uh, they use the super yachts as rescue ships. Oh, so wow. super yacht owners donate their super yachts, which are all beautiful. They fill them up to the brim with supplies and, take and they over. send them <laughs> out as supply ships. And they have, they have, of course have spent a lot of time in the last few months or the last year uh, in the Bahamas and the Caribbean. Um, and they were almost the first, the first line of, uh, of defense, you know, to, they were out there, you know, straight from Fort Lauderdale, filled up, boom, yeah. and sending them out. Um, fantastic charity. Um, we've worked for many, many years and we're very, very privileged to have been chosen and be trusted uh, by the Prince Albert II Foundation um, to uh, to work with them and to host a, um, a high visibility event at the Monaco Grand Prix mm -hmm. uh, to bring you know the charity, the foundation to our guests who are coming in from all over the world um, and to raise awareness and funds. We do silent auctions on board. And as part of that, uh, again, we've been honored uh, uh, quite a number of times uh, with History and Highness Prince Albert, who, who is a tremendous, extraordinary individual, uh, and actually in Los Angeles um, today, uh, and because he is hosting a gala tonight, tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they'll have Macy Gray performing and Sharon Stone, and uh, and I, I, I should think they'll probably raise uh, you know, $10 million tonight at a, at a beautiful private home uh, up in the Hollywood Hills. And um, so, you know, he is incredibly passionate um, and, and, and about... Um, uh, ecology and the oceans especially and obviously Monaco being such a unique principality and it is a very very special place and I would uh, advise anyone uh, you know if you have never been to Monaco 
you know, do do go and visit Monaco. Yeah. It is an amazing, amazing place. Don't get swept away by the Casino Square and the opulence <laughs> and the, all the Rolls Royces and things that are driving around because it does give you a slightly Beverly Hills-esque view of the whole place. And it is a small country. Um, there's so much more to it. 50,000 people a day drive into Monaco from the neighboring regions of France and Italy to go to work in Monaco, 50,000 wow. a day. It's the largest employer in the region. Yeah. Um, and, and it's everything from the uh, Athletics Federation, you know, the IAAF, to the Atomic Energy Foundation, to, I mean, so many diverse companies are based in Monaco now uh, and employing you know, amazingly talented people. And the foundation does amazing work and they've worked um, you know, very closely uh, with you know, world, world leaders and as you say, with Davos, of course, he's yeah. attending Davos. Um, and so, yeah, so we work with also with the Blue Angels Foundation, uh, which is uh, incredible. I mean, I'm a pilot, a private pilot. And the Blue Angels Foundation, we collaborate with their, um, their former lead pilots uh, during the Navy Fleet Week. A celebration in San Francisco okay. in October. Again, raising funds, raising awareness and visibility. Um, and, you know, they are all about post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, you know, we're losing 22 servicemen a day yeah. through suicide. Uh, you know, it doesn't get talked about enough. These people sacrifice an enormous amount, uh, you know, for their countries and, and so that we can actually enjoy the freedoms that we so graciously do enjoy. And, um, you know, these people need help. Uh, so we are very proud to work with those those charities um, and um, uh, we you know we also work with a number of others as well uh, depending upon where we are in the world uh, in St. Bart's we've worked with a handicap charity local mm -hmm. handicap charity and we hosted our first events there about five years ago St. Bart's is this tiny beautiful little island in the in the in the uh, Caribbean uh, next to St. Martin and uh, so we hosted a charity event there when we founded or I helped co-found the Gustavia Yacht Club which is a little yeah, I was going to wrap up with that, but I'm yeah. glad you brought that in there. So talk about that for a minute because we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, St. Bart's is one of the most unique opportunities around New Year's Eve. I haven't mm -hmm. been, but I have people that go said it's fabulous. You did, after the actual hurricane, mm -hmm. one of the only we did parties the only and one, events yeah. there, but you've also helped open... The yes. Yacht Club. So just talk about that for a minute, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap yeah, up. Yeah, there's some everything. local friends from Monaco, and and uh, you know, interesting people, and they, they had we we just thought of an idea. It was it was led by uh, Sostelios, who is uh, the original founder of, uh, and with his family of uh, the EasyJet uh, Group, and EasyJet is the airline in Europe. It's the Southwest Airlines yeah. of Europe, orange airplanes, and uh, so um, he's a huge philanthropist, and uh, and he's a big fan of St. Bart's, and and he and a number of our friends collaborated to to create a little yacht club there to give a, an opportunity for people to meet a meeting space in 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 a very small but very beautiful uh, town uh, and a, a very intimate port and um, again it's all about connecting people that that's the beauty of what we do i i have so many stories i having 15 years of events five to ten events a year hundreds of people all over the world from Hong Kong to San Francisco to Los Angeles to Miami for Art Basel obviously the Monaco Grand Prix Cannes Film Festival and we were creating these yacht experiences all over the world and people meet and amazing things happen yeah. we've had babies we've had marriages <laughs> we've had business deals we've had watches airplanes <coughs> bought and sold uh, super yachts changing hands uh, and if nothing else a great time and a great time yeah. to, to to celebrate a great occasion yeah and so as I said, I've been fortunate to go there. They're amazing. Nicholas Frankel, my yacht group, the space thing, super excited about yes. that. That's going to be game changer. Some of your events, any ultra high net worth brands, anybody that wants to be sort of in that area, reach out. Nicholas has a fabulous program. He and his twin sister, Annabelle, run it. Your dad's amazing. 82, I, still going. 82, still. I did pick him up, though, at the... At, That's right. At Monaco, I saw him standing on the corner about to catch the bus. <laughs> I'm like, jump in, let's go. Well, the bus go. is actually good in Monaco. It's a pretty good good bus service They are, but I saw him standing there, so I gave yeah. him a ride. But He's celebrating, I think, 54th Monaco Grand Prix this year. Yeah. He's 82. And anytime I'm, I'm uh, on the yacht, I'm always wondering where he is. And I'm always wondering where the prettiest girls are. And they're always next to him. And they all come down from the top deck and they say, oh, my goodness, your father is so charming. <laughs> Oh, good. Uh, maybe it passed down to you as well. Speaking of which, family doing great. Yes. So uh, Jennifer and Jelena are doing great, yeah. and uh, they're coming to the gala. Well, Jelena's not coming to the gala, but Jennifer's coming to the gala tonight, so she's getting ready. And it should be a very, very, very special evening here during Oscar week. So yeah, perfect. Yeah, looking perfect. forward. To, looking forward to it. All right. Well, big thanks to Nicholas Frankel, my yacht group. Amazing job. Keep up the good work. Anybody that wants to go to space, if you have an extra. 
50 million or just cobble it together from your friends. Unique opportunity. Steve and me closing up the Bullseye Guy podcast. Great stuff as always. Groove Radio. Eagle, we love the studios downtown, so tune in again next week. Steve and Mead, thank you very much.